Hi everyone, thanks for attending my talk. Today I'm going to talk about side channels and using them to break cryptographic implementations and uh, more specifically trying to attack trusted platform modules. My name is Daniel Morimi. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm a security researcher and I've been doing my PhD at Booster Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. Uh, in my PhD, I've been working on microarchitectural attacks, side channels, and using them to break uh, different cryptographic implementations. When we try to look at the crypto scheme as an analyst, as an attacker, we are generally interested in recovering a secret key, let's say K, and this uh, secret key K, maybe we want to try to recover it or try to at least learn some information about it to degrade the security of the scheme. And uh, there are really smart people out there that they do theoretical crypto analysis. They look at the input and output of this uh, crypto system and try to uh, basically find an attack that can break that scheme. For example, uh, there was an attack on PlayStation 3 a, a while back, and this was due to a design weakness in the way they were using ECDSA signature scheme. Uh, in ECDSA, which is also kind of related to our discussion today, we basically use some mathematical formula here to compute a signature pair R and S. And this mathematical, mathematical formula, everything in this mathematical, mathematical formula is public except uh, secret key D and uh, nonce KI that we generate this nonce for every single signature that we generate. So this is really important that this nonce is really important for the security of the CDSA. And if we don't generate this nonce in a uniform and random fashion, or if we use the same nonce, this actually breaks this scheme. And Actually, somebody thought it's a good idea at the time, and Sony was using uh, the same nonce to sign all these messages. So you could just generate two signatures and subtract them, and you would get uh, an equation like this, and you could basically use this equation to uh, recover the private key without any additional computation or problem or any, uh, any additional analysis. So this was a simple attack by just looking at the input and output, but when we talk about side channel crypto analysis, we are assuming that the design of the uh, crypto system is actually secure, and we are trying to use a side effect of the <coughs> implementation of that crypto systems uh, during runtime to, to basically break the scheme. So we said side effect are all sorts of uh, side channel information that may be leaked during the computation of these uh, schemes on a hardware or software. For instance, there are power attack, EM attack, or, or timing analysis, or CPU side channel attacks. And the idea of all these attacks is that uh, during the computation of these algorithms, if the uh, computing device do the operation based on the secret, do different operation based on the secret, this may leave some physical trace in, in one of these side channel analysis techniques. And uh, there are, of course, many of these attacks, but here today we are mostly focused on timing analysis and CPU side channels. And uh, also there are different threat models for these attacks. No, there is no single threat model for these attacks. Sometimes uh, these attacks can be performed remotely, sometimes locally. Some of these attacks need, need, need physical access. For instance, the attacks people do on the smart cards. So there is no easy way to say uh, what is the proper threat model or way to uh, implement all these uh, implementation in a way to be secure against these attacks, of course. So why do we care about these attacks now, like uh, in, in this hardware security conference, I would say. Uh, so we have so many different complex threat models nowadays, and uh, we know that we cannot simply rely on the software, or even now with the previous talks, like even on the CPU, we cannot trust the commodity computer to hold all of our secrets. So there is a need for hardware-based root of trust. And one of the solutions that like we, we know of are called uh, trusted platform modules. And these, platform, these uh, trusted platform modules, they, they basically act like as a crypto coprocessor. You can find them on, uh, on almost any computing device nowadays. You can find it on your laptop, on desktop computers, on handheld devices. So this trusted, trusted platform module only run a specific limited number of operations, and it's a, 
it also is supposed to be resistant against attacks. For instance, they have uh, claims and certification that, okay, this trusted platform module is uh, resistant against sidechain attacks or it's resistant against uh, some uh, fault attacks. So you put uh, all these keys of uh, that you have, for instance, for financial transactions, for passwords and everything, you can put these things inside this trusted computing base that you created with uh, trusted platform modules. And you put everything else as unsecure and untrusted in, when you use uh, one of these security devices. So what do we have inside a trusted platform module? We have uh, many cryptographic functionalities. And today in this talk, we care about digital signatures. Uh, but these devices have all sorts of other crypto functionalities like r random number generator, encryption engines, and all that. Uh, so digital signatures are important because we use them every day for all sorts of transactions on the internet. And and uh, one thing that we can do is we can use these trusted platform modules to actually execute uh, execute the signing operation and also to store the private keys. And by doing that, we make sure that if the software, if the CPU, if everything is compromised, nobody has access to our long-term certificate or, or private key. And now, nowadays, there are all sorts of software stack like OpenSSL or StrongSwan or Microsoft Windows that they actually support using TPM for, for these operations. And uh, another important feature of using site, using uh, digital signatures uh, on TPM is remote attestation because we can actually attest that if a remote computer is is a legitimate device, is it's not a malicious device by using remote attestation and uh, hardware support for that. And remote attestation schemes are generally uh, based on some sort of digital signature. So. Uh, we said that, okay, these magic uh, ch chips, these magic hardwares, they are going to solve our security problems. How do we go about that? Uh, there is a trusted computing group, and uh, this organization is basically, is basically maintaining the standard for how a TPM should, uh, should operate, what are the standard schemes that the TPM should support, what are the key size and all that. But in addition to function functional uh, correctness of these devices, this uh, trusted computing group also look over uh, security certification for these devices. And uh, many of these devices, they have a security certification called CCEAL4+, which means that these devices are supposed to be resistant against most of the side channel attacks that we are talking about today. And uh, for instance, if you go on these websites, uh, Trusted Computing Group, they, they have a list of uh, ST microelectronic, Nuvoton, Infineon, TPM chips that they are all supposed to be uh, resistant against sidechain attacks. So the question is, are these really resistant against sidechain attacks? How good are these security certificates? Or can we actually show show that that's not true or, or not? So. Uh, one of the most important uh, sidechain attacks is, of course, timing attacks, because uh, first of all, they are not very intrusive. You don't need a physical access sometimes to the device. And most of the time, they can even be performed remotely. So to perform a proper timing uh, analysis or timing attack of uh, these devices, we need to have uh, a precise timer. And in this uh, research, we use the CPU cycle count as our precise uh, timing source. Uh, and the reason for that is that the CPU frequency is much higher than the uh, TPM chips generally. The TPM chips are generally low powered microcontrollers. They run maybe 32 megahertz or, or not that fast, but the CPU is generally 100 times faster than that. So if we use the CPU cycle count as a timer, that would be a good uh, timing resource, of course. So one of these uh, TPM uh, devices that we analyzed, uh, that we're going to talk about it more specifically, is, the, is Intel uh, Platform Trust Technology. Is uh, This is not an actual dedicated TPM chip, but uh, it's running a firmware TPM inside something called CSME. CSME uh, is part of the same CPU die on all uh, Intel CPUs nowadays. And, the idea here is that even though CSME doesn't have a good uh, history of uh, good security history in the past because of all other physical attacks or problems with it, but 
The idea is that uh, the CPU core and the root software or anything that runs on the CPU doesn't have access to the memory of this CSME. So Intel decided to use this also to implement the firmware TPM. So there is a firmware TPM module running inside the CSME and uh, most computers nowadays just use this instead of having a dedicated uh, T TPM chip from a third party. So we did a simple test using the CPU cycle count on execution of ECDSA on this FTPM. So it turns out that for many signatures that we generated, some of them are generated faster than the others. And here we see that this Gaussian distribution that we, uh, we drew here based on the histogram of this, uh, this uh, data is, is actually not uniform. So we saw that, okay, some signatures are generated faster, some signatures are generated slower. So this tells us that actually uh, these TPMs cannot be for sure constant time or they are not necessarily resistant against this attack. Uh, but to do a better analysis and also do more analysis, analysis of other devices, what we did is that we developed a tool uh, which is kind of a customized uh, uh, kernel driver that modified the uh, Linux uh, TPM kernel stack to perform these measurements uh, more precisely and also closer to the interface of the device. And when we did that and when we executed that, for instance, on Intel FTPM again, we saw that, okay, we see now a much more cleaner uh, leakage because there are like different uh, sections of this uh, distribution. There are like three, four different distributions here and each distribution has relatively uh, 16 times more samples compared to the other one. So, this gave us the idea that, okay, these devices can be vulnerable, so why not analyzing more devices? So we analyzed a bunch of machines we had in the lab, and some of them runs the same Intel PTT firmware TPM with different firmware versions, and some of them, they have their own dedicated TPM chip. And it turns out that in addition to Intel FTPM, there is also another dedicated TPM chip uh, developed by the ST Microelectronics that, is actually, uh, that actually has a similar vulnerability. And uh, and what is this vulnerability? What what are we talking about? Is basically there is a correlation between the number of leading zero bits in the nonce and the timing of the operation. For instance, if we use a nonce like this uh, top in the in this top, we see that okay, the timing operation um, executes like around 4.8 billion something. Uh, but if there is four leading zero bits in the nonce, we see that this is faster. If there is no zero, zero bits, again, it's, it's slower. And if you have more leading zero bits, like eight leading zero bits, then again, it's faster. And if you have 12 leading zero bits, then again, much, much faster. So we see that for every additional four bits of leading zero bits in the nonce, we get a different Gaussian distribution uh, for, for the signature generation. Uh, so, and that, that's the, basically the overall thing we see. So similarly, ST Microelectronics has also a similar vulnerability. It's not, a, it's not for every four bit, but for every additional leading zero bits, we see a timing uh, difference. And that's why here, the Gaussian distribution for ST Microelectronics, at first sight, it looks like a normal distribution, but we see that on the left side, uh, there are more samples and there is like a, a steep that goes up here. And uh, if we just filter every signature that is generated before at a certain point, all of the signatures are guaranteed to have X amount of uh, leading zero bits. And here uh, we see that there is a linear relationship between the number of uh, leading zero bits in in the signature in the nonce and the timing for ST microelectronic ECDSA operation. So what can we do with this? So we know that, okay, with uh, some signatures, we can learn a little bit of the nonce. Is this enough to break ECDSA? The answer is yes. ECDSA is heavy, is heavily relied on this nonce and even leaking a little bit of this nonce can, can break the entire scheme. So there is a, there is a well-known technique called lattice-based uh, attacks on ECDSA that can actually Help, helps us with this. So what we did in, in our attack is basically we collect a list of signatures and timing samples for each of those signatures. And then we're gonna filter the signatures based on the timing samples and just keep the signatures that have a short notch.
and then we can use lattice-based cryptoanalysis to actually recover the key. So what is the lattice-based attack uh, on this scheme? We're not going to go to the detail of lattice-based attack, but the main idea is that we can rewrite this equation to a much simpler equation. And in the simpler equations, all the green values are known values that we already know. There, is, there are public values, and then there are the uh, private values, ki, nonce, and the private key d. Uh, then we have an, another additional information about this uh, because of the timing information, which is a bound, upper bound over the value of the nonce. So we know that all the nonces are shorter than an X amount because we leaked some information on that. And this becomes actually an instance of a well-known mathematical problem called hidden number problem that can be solved using uh, lattice-based reduction techniques. And the basic idea is that uh, you can construct a matrix like that based on the known information of uh, A and B. And then if you feed this to a LLL algorithm, it can give you the key. And uh, for this, you can just use uh, SageMath. And SageMath, for instance, has these functions. And if you construct the proper matrix and feed it this properly, it can actually give you the key. So this is like a magic, but it works. Uh, we ran this on different uh, experiments, different uh, devices. So with Intel FTPM, we could actually recover the key after about 1,200 uh, signatures. And the times to collect those signatures takes four minutes to collect those signatures. And for ST microelectronic, we needed 40,000 signatures to recover the key. And it takes 80 minutes to recover that amount of signatures. And note that the attack itself running the lattice-based uh, reduction technique just takes um, a few seconds or at most a minute. So it's mostly collecting signatures that in this attack takes some time. So the question is, can we do better? Uh, uh, so these TPMs, of course, are supposed to be protected against local attacks, even roots, uh, roots on the CPU or, or even some physical attacks. But uh, can we even do this remotely? Well, probably yes, because uh, these devices are running very slow. So if you are, you are connecting these devices even indirectly to a network, you can probably measure the timing differences even over the network. So to verify this, we actually did a real real world ex example, real world experiment here. And uh, we used a strong Swan VPN solution. And a strong Swan VPN solution can actually be configured to use a TPM device for authentication. Uh, when we configured a strong Swan to use TPM authentication, the way it uh, works is that the VPN use a IKE protocol to do a DTL man key exchange first. And this, this basically gives the client a server a shared secret key, and they can use this for encryption. But uh, to avoid somebody doing a man-in-the-middle attack and pretend that he's a web server, you need to also authenticate the the handshake and the second authentic the, the second handshake is actually for the authentication. The VPN client is going to send an authentication authentication request. The server is going to sign that authentication request using the TPM and get the response and return it back to the client. And then the client can verify if the if the server is a legitimate server. And note that here the server doesn't even has its own doesn't have access to the private keys. So. The VPN client, the VPN server, they only have access to the public key, public key, and only the TPM device has access to the private key. So even if the VPN server is compromised, nobody can uh, pretend and do an active man in the middle attack here. But using this timing information, we can again do this operation and collect enough signatures to actually recover that private key. And we did this attack uh, with 44,000 handshakes that takes five hours on a local network. We managed to actually get enough timing samples and get enough timing information to actually filter our signatures and recover the secret key. And here we see that, for instance, we could recover the secret key with about 60%, uh, 70% success rate uh, in this attack. So some may argue that, OK, uh, this is a, a remote attack with just one network hub, but we are talking about a, a TPM chip that is supposed to be even uh, uh, resistant against physical attacks. And we can still do an attack on a local network that can be totally practical in an organization or other fast networks here. So we do a comparison here of different uh, histograms we got from the Intel FTPM, for instance. And we see that, OK, for system adversary, 
uh, we see a very clean leakage for user adversary. We still see the leakage. We can distinguish. And same with remote adversary with a strong swan. So this precise timer gives us the ability to do the attack anyway. So it's just uh, the fact that more noise makes it harder. You have to collect more samples. The more noise you have, you, of course, have to collect more samples. So this is not the first time that we actually attack like a elliptic curve digital signature scheme and uh, before like in a couple of years ago we did this attack called cash code on uh, intel sgx remote attestation and uh, they had a similar scalar multiplication that is used as part of a different crypto schemes called epid and this crypto scheme was used uh, to do some sort of digital signature for remote attestation of uh, enclaves on uh, SGX. And we noticed that, okay, there is a timing behavior, and we can, we, at the time, we actually could use cache attacks to exactly count the number of loop of a, a fixed window implementation and leak this device. So wh what's the story here? Why do uh, Intel uh, make these mistakes again and again? Or why do, why is it so hard to, implement constant time crypto implementation. So if you look at closer to like CDSA uh, crypto system and how people implement this, it, it's actually not that simple uh, that many may, may think. So uh, elliptic curves is of course a complex topic to, to learn now, but the, the basic idea is that when we have elliptic curve, we can do two operations, two main operations on this elliptic curve. One main operation is doubling a point, which means we find another point on the curve by doubling a point we have. And the doubling operation here is depicted how it's performed. And there is another operation called adding a two points together, which means you have two points and you try to find a third point by adding these two points together. And with elliptic curves, we are guaranteed that by doing double or add, we always get a point again on the same curve. And with these two simple operations, we can also implement all sorts of other operations. For instance, the first operation is in CDSA is called a scalar multiplication, which means uh, we need to multiply a number by a point. And for instance, with just uh, add and double, we can implement this uh, a scalar multiplication multiplying the scalar tree by the point G is just doubling G and just adding G to it. So it's one double and one add operation. Similarly, we can also do all sorts of other scalar multiplication by just a double and add operation. And if you look at this, for instance, in a more complex scenario, you see that there are lots of do doubles and then again, a few adds in between. So the idea is, uh, we get, at, we get to a point that we have an algorithm here that tells us, okay, for every zero in the bit of the nonce, we're gonna just do double, but if we have a one, we're gonna also add do an add operation. And this is gonna be an algorithm to do a scalar multiplication. And each of the execution of the algorithm, each, each uh, iteration of this algorithm on a CPU can take maybe 5,000 cycles because this add and double operation takes some time. And, uh, the idea is this is a, not a constant time algorithm. It can leak information about this, uh, what was the value of the nonce, right? Uh, because it iterates over every bit of the nonce and then it do a different operation depending on that. So we know that we could just implement it maybe in a different way. Why is it so hard? There are, there are so many different ways to implement a scalar multiplication. There are Montgomery double and add algorithm, there is a sliding window, there is fixed window. And for instance, this implementation that we attacked on Intel FTPM, it looked like a fixed window leakage that leaks the number of leading zero bits in the, in the nut. So, so this is not as easy. There is also other operations during the signature operation, and each of these operations can be implemented in so many different ways. Uh, and the threat model is also not clear for crypto developers. They don't know if this crypto software is going to run on an airplane or it's, if it's going to run on a cloud server. So that, that makes it all difficult for people to actually analyze the systems and try to find if an implementation is vulnerable or not. Uh, so. A while back, we tried to, even before we did this TPM work, TPM failed work, we did the, uh, we implemented a tool trying to analyze uh, cryptographic implementations to find these leakages. And, at, and people actually didn't care about that tool as much as they cared about attacking the TPM. But uh, the idea is 
you can use these tools to actually find these vulnerabilities before you deploy this to uh, hardware and 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 uh, mass produce it right so we try to simplify what are the leakages that can happen from a software point of view. Uh, so one one way that the software leaks uh, information to the hardware is that you do a secret dependent control flow. Another way is you do a secret dependent memory access. For instance, this is common in AES. In AES implementation, we have something called SBox in AES crypto system. And this SBox can directly get the value of uh, key or some value that is depending on the key. And then you do a memory access that depends on the key and that leaks some information to a cache adversary, for instance. And there are all sorts of other problems too. For instance, some uh, CPUs have operations that are not constant time and it leaks some information about an input of the operation. And on ARM, we have a multiplication operation that is not constant time necessarily. So how do we find these leakages on a software assuming that the hardware has some behavior that can leak data? So we developed a cool tool called Microwalk and the microwalk, the goal here is to do automated analysis uh, using dynamic approach. And also we wanted to do it in a binary level because uh, we, we may see leakages that are introduced after compilation of the software. Also, some softwares are closed source. We want to look at those two. So, and we also wanted to find actual instruction that is related to the leakage and we that's how we designed this tool. So in practice, the ideology, the philosophy behind this tool is that uh, an attacker generally measures some vague information like execution time or memory usage pattern. But in theory, what attacker gets is uh, the outcome of uh, like an execution trace, like an, the number of executions, the, the number of executed instructions, what branch has been taken, what part of memory has been accessed. This is the actual source of the leakage. So if we try to find these leakages, it's better to actually look at the source rather than the vague uh, side channel leakage. So we developed uh, this tool and we basically what we do in our approach is we generate a set of random test cases, inputs to a crypto system, whether it's the key, whether it's the message, whether it's the nonce, and we feed the crypto system with all these inputs. And then uh, we can compare the traces we get uh, from each other, from the execution trace. And then if there is a difference between the execution trace, we can assume that there was a leakage. We also came up with another approach that actually gives us the exact instruction that uh, leaks. And in this other approach, what we do is actually we collect two traces or uh, many traces, and then we compute the mutual information between uh, different, uh, between mutual information for a specific instruction between different traces. And that actually gives us uh, some confidence value whether an instruction is related to, to leakage because the input is changing. And if the instruction operands also change, that means uh, there was a leakage. So we implemented this using pin tool. Pin tool is a binary instrumentation, instrumentation framework. And we run this on window on, uh, yeah, on Intel CPUs and windows. And we collect these traces. And then we use CPU emulation and some other uh, things to actually affect the input a little bit. Because sometimes we want to replace a random number that is generated in the crypto system to see what it behaves. And then uh, we do some. We get some trace, we pre-process that traces to actually become a normalized trace because sometimes we care about just the offset of memory accesses, not the entire exact address. And, and we apply also some leakage granularity. For instance, if you are only interested in cache leakage, we can say, oh, just discard the last six bit of address that you collected during the trace. So after we got these traces and after pre-processing, then we feed this pre-processed trace to our analysis techniques. And then we figure out if there was a leakage or what instruction it was leaking. And we could also do all sorts of analysis based on CPU, CPU side channel attacks, based on the number of, uh, based on what we want by configuring this tool. So this tool was useful. That we could, these vendors, if they knew about this tool, they could actually find these vulnerabilities before we find us later. Uh, so we'll get back to the story of uh, responsible disclosure. The story is we reported this vulnerability to ST. They acknowledged we had so many phone calls, discussions. Unfortunately, they had no experience with 
responsible disclosure. They didn't even know why we are talking to them. And uh, so <laughs> it was an interesting experience to do responsible disclosure with this vendor. But uh, in general, things went smooth. And we also helped them to uh, verify the new version of their TPM firmware. And then later on, some vendors issued that, OK, uh, they have to update the firmware for ST micro TPM or uh, so. Uh, with Intel, we also had a responsible disclosure, and they uh, told us, okay, the reason we had this vulnerability is because of an outdated Intel IPP crypto library. And surprisingly, they they took this problem so seriously, they gave us an embargo that takes about nine months. Uh, but they should have known this issue, uh, maybe about this issue one year before, because we already developed the micro work tool one year before this, and we reported a whole bunch of vulnerabilities on Intel IPP before. So this shows that uh, these vendors, first of all, they don't find these vulnerabilities in their own product because they don't use the proper tool. And second, even if they find, sometimes they forget to update, update the firmware for, for all of their products. So they have a vulnerability in a specific library. They don't update all the inst instance of their product to be patched against that vulnerability. Um, finally, I would like to also thank all the collaborators on these works that I've done. Uh, Berg Sunar, my supervisor, Nadia Henningar, Thomas Eisenbart, and Jan Bischelman. And uh, I would be happy to take uh, questions.